UNO has always been an expanding university, constantly moving forward. But as we move forward, we must also look back to where we began. Let's go back in time with the people who remember UNO the way it was. Join us for Reflections in Time. It's a beautiful late spring day in 1991. And uh, as usual, when we do these series of programs called Reflections in Time, we're in the Health Education and Health Physical Education Recreation Building here at UNO, where we sit down with people who have spent a lot of time at our university. A lot of years ago, about 12, I started to think, wouldn't it be nice to save these people that have contributed so much to the life of our campus, both to faculty and staff, but mainly, of course, to our students. And so we began now at this talk stage in 1991. We have about 71 people, and today with me is number 72, and she's Dr. Barbara Buckalter, who's been a member of our math, and more lately, our math and computer science department for a long time, and she's about to move off to a part of the world that I love very much, the Southwest. But before she goes, Barbara, I'm glad you came to sit and visit with me and talk about old times and current and maybe a little about the futures. First of all, Barbara, I've never asked you this. We've never conversed about this particular aspect of life. When did life all begin for you? Where do you come from? Where do you hail from? It? I come from Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Oh, way out east. Small town, 30 miles uh, from Pittsburgh. Uh-huh. Uh, mountainous. A very nice little town, about 25,000 people. Uh-huh. And you come from a small, a big family? What kind? A uh, large family, seven children. Oh, six my. Six girls and one boy. One poor boy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but I am, uh, I was next to the oldest. Uh-huh. Uh, the oldest one was killed in an automobile accident when she was in her 30s, so I'm the oldest. The others are all living in, mostly in Arizona and California. Oh, well, you'd be close to family then when you moved to Arizona. Right. Now, going back to those early years, sometimes it's hard to recollect. What was life like in a little town outside of Pittsburgh for you? Actually, what were some of your interests? Actually, very nice. I mean, maybe on reflection, at the time, when I, by the time I was a teenager, I couldn't wait till I could go off to college <laughs> and go away. So. Yeah. But uh, when I was there, uh, and I think back on it, those were really nice. Actually, it was during the Depression when I grew up, but... Uh, I don't think that, uh, I mean, nobody had any money, but we were fortunate. We never worried about eating and things like that, but you just didn't spend the money that you do now with children. And you did things, simple things like Girl Scouts, and, uh -huh. and uh, I think we were much more involved in school activities than kids ha do now because they have part-time jobs. So you, there weren't many jobs, and you were involved with school. No, and worked. Yeah. And the kids never worked. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a lot of time devoted to school. What, uh, well, all right, then you grew, and you went to high school, and then it was time for college. By that time, had you decided what you'd like to do? Uh, yes, actually, I uh, entered, uh, I went to Temple University in Philadelphia. What oh, did and you? I was a pre-med. Oh, you were going to be a doctor. Right, and I... Uh, I did finish the pre-med course, but when I was a junior, I had to pick a major. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what have I been taking? This is a, not a very great motivation. But I thought, what have I been taking? I've been getting high grades in, and it seems like it's been no effort, and it mm -hmm. was math. Uh -huh. So I thought, well, I'll be a math major. <laughs> that was like a sound decision. <laughs> and then you know, I still intended to go to medical school, uh -huh. but I began to think, probably had poor counseling or no counseling, but I began to think about my science courses, and the one I liked the least was biology. Why and so, you recall? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, well, I do recall, because I really never did more than the basic stuff, and it's total memorization. It mm -hmm. didn't seem very creative or interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the physical uh, sciences, chemistry and physics, were much more interesting to me, and I thought, well, uh -huh. what am I going to medical school for if... I don't like biology particularly. In fact, in all of the sciences, although I have a lot of credits in science and I have even taught it 
in public school. Mm-hmm. When it comes to land, I am all thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very good in the in the lecture part of the phys- of science, but when it comes to land, I think I broke everything there was in the chemistry. <laughs> you know, so, so you know that just wasn't your forte. So you see, in math, you don't have land. No, <laughs> just have a blackboard. Just use your head. Yeah, or a green board. Right. Well, so. So I can't say that I, I entered mathematics for any lofty reasons. It was only later. In fact, it was much later when I was in graduate school, and got into more abstract math that I got really interested in mathematics. Yeah, after your undergraduate degree, did you go directly to to undergraduate school, or did you yeah. do something else after that happened? When I was a senior at Temple and only needed 21 credits to finish, I got married, and oh. I quit, uh-huh. <laughs> to the dismay of my parents. Oh, of course. <laughs> and I dropped out. I actually only dropped out for one year. Unfortunately, my father died during that year, and I've always felt like, you know, I hope he knows I finally finished. But mm-hmm. anyway, mm-hmm. I uh, then moved back to my hometown and uh, went to Seton Hill College, oh. which is a very fine uh, girls' school. When you say time. Seton Hill, I think of it's Seton, Seton Hall. Hall. It's Seton Hill. Yeah. It's a Catholic girls' school, oh, beautiful school in Greensburg, and um, a small school, uh, and very... Um, oriented to students going on to graduate school. Whereas at Temple, the math majors were more geared to like working for engineers, uh-huh, uh-huh. that type of thing. So here's where you got a thrust that moved you. That's yes, right. Short, Although tortilla. I really finished most of my math. So while I was there, since it took me two years, I only needed 21 credits, two years and a summer to finish, because in a small school, everything isn't given every semester. Right, and indeed. because they had different requirements. I had a bunch of freshman type sophomore courses to take, you know, to finish mm-hmm. their requirements. Mm-hmm. I thought, well, I'm spending so much time on it, I would pick up a teaching certificate. And I never, While you're at it, never huh? intended to teach. <laughs> I was in liberal arts. Anyway, I, so I got a teaching certificate there. And uh, when I graduated, the first job I got, I was totally unqualified for, it was in elementary school. <laughs> And I had to go before this, it was a community outside of Greensburg, Hemfield Township, uh, a rural consolidated school district. Uh-huh. And you had to go before the school board to be interviewed. And there were all these women in the office that were waiting to be interviewed. They were all mature women who had taught school and then left to raise families. And I thought, well, how would I get this job? It turned out none of them had degrees. They had like two-year normal school Oh, the normal training. school thing, yeah. And I got for the worst reasons. I got the job because I had a degree. I mean, my degree was in math no. with a teaching certificate for secondary school. <laughs> but here I got this job teaching fourth and fifth graders oh my. in the same classroom. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of homework for you. It was a lot of work. I have had great appreciation of elementary school teachers ever since. I only did it one year. And at the end of the year, I told them if they couldn't find me a job in junior high, I was quitting. <laughs> <laughs> because it was too much work. Oh, yeah. You had to even eat lunch with the students. You didn't have helpers like that. No. Go out on the playground with the students. And these fourth and fifth graders I had, every, 45 people all together, but everyone sent me their worst fourth graders. They, <laughs> they all read about the second grade level. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I muddled through that year, and uh, then I taught for them two years in a junior high. They did move uh, to the junior high. The junior high went through 10th grade, and I taught, if I tell you all the subjects I taught, I mean, besides arithmetic and algebra, general science, girls, PE, and health. Oh, my, oh, my, uh, oh, my. The, uh, uh, I even coached the girls' basketball team, and I didn't even know how to play. <laughs> <laughs> and after those two years, uh, to be honest, I quit because they were bringing new people in, now, I started at $2,400. Uh, what year would that have been, Barbara? That was 1952. Ah. I um, taught for three years for the Hemphill Township School District, mm-hmm. and I started out 2400 then 2600 2800 and well, I you got to raise made, every year. <laughs> I would have made 3000 the next year, and I found out that new people were going to get 3600 Wow. So I was really furious. 
that I didn't need a job anyway, and my husband was a pharmacist and had a good job, and I, the woman that ran the fountain in the drugstore he worked in made more money than I did. <laughs> so I uh, told them I wouldn't come back unless I got at least what the beginning teachers got. And all summer long, they kept uh, calling me up. They never found anybody to replace me, but they said they couldn't hire me at the new teacher's salary. Oh, for heaven's so sake. So I quit. And the following January, we moved to Tucson, Arizona, uh -huh. where my mother had already moved with all my younger sisters and brother uh, when my father died. And in Tucson, I had decided I was never going to teach school again. It didn't pay enough. That was it. Right. So I didn't even go and apply for a teaching job, and I worked at the university in the uh, duplicating, well, it was an office in which they published books, uh -huh. and uh, got the job under false pretenses. She asked me if I knew how to use an electric typewriter, and I said, of course, oh. I've never even seen one. I thought, how could it be different from a regular typewriter? <laughs> it wasn't too long till she found out I was not very good, but I had a minored in English in college, and she, that helped. And she had me proofreading books all the time I worked there. Didn't need to type. <laughs> right. Anyway, she kept asking me why I didn't get a job teaching school. It turned out that teachers were very well paid in Tucson because they had to compete with California, which oh. was the highest paid in the country. Uh -huh. So when I found that out about May, I went down and applied. And they must have needed math teachers very badly because I left there after my interview. And the next, They must have put the contract in the mail the minute I walked out because the next day in the mail, the contract came. <laughs> wow, now we're back in teaching. <laughs> so then I, that's how I got into teaching. And I taught in uh, two years in junior high, and then I taught five years in high school, at Catalina High School in Tucson. Uh -huh. And meanwhile, I kept going to school working on a master's degree. Was it in 1962? Uh, I received my master's in 19... From the University of... Uh, but this University of Arizona. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, uh, one of the big things I was involved in in Tucson when I taught in the public schools, I was one of the uh, original people in the modern math movement. Oh. Under Dr. Beaverman from the University of Illinois, uh -huh. uh, the University of Illinois Committee on School Mathematics, UICSM. Uh, we were part of the experiment where you actually receive the, the materials hot off the press every day that we were supposed to teach in the classroom. It was, really a, very exciting, it was a very exciting time to be uh -huh. in public school teaching. Yeah. After um, I decided to get a PhD, I then was a graduate assistant at the University of Arizona mm -hmm. and uh, also worked as a uh, before I left Tucson as a uh, math and science coordinator in the Catalina Foothill School District right outside of Tucson. So you were heavily involved with teaching and graduate work and right. research and uh, elementary and secondary and most everything. Every level. Yeah. And I taught courses for teachers in the summer, you know, in National Science Foundation in-service courses. Well, whatever caused you to, to leave Tucson? Well, seemed like you were pretty well settled there. Yes, except that my husband decided to go. We had a drugstore, and he decided to go back to school and get his Ph.D. And when he did, in a sense, we, he worked himself out of a job because he had a he was doing research there, but they didn't hire their own graduates. You know, they ah. wanted them to go, so we had to leave, and. Uh, we went out to California thinking that it would be very easy to get a job, but it turned out to be a poor year to get college teaching jobs. Right. And we both taught one year in a high school. When would this have been? Uh, 1967. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. One year. And uh, my husband had never taught school. And he taught one year, he taught math, <laughs> which was really funny. But anyway, in Covina High School. I taught at West Covina High oh, School yeah. for a year. I had a cousin who used to be a pastor there. And I finished my dissertation while uh -huh. I was there and got my degree in 68. Sounded like it was a busy year for you. Well, I guess every year. Every year was a busy year. So, California, you... Uh, now, didn't what brought us to Tucson was that Leonard got a, uh, an appointment at uh, Creighton University Pharmacy. So. Oh, so that's... So, when he came, I would really knew nothing about Omaha. I insisted that uh, we had uh, one son by then who was... Oh, uh, what was he, about eight years old? Anyway, uh, 
seven or eight. We, uh, 1968, he was eight years old. We came to Omaha and my son and I came with him because I wanted to see what this town looked like. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, they have a large building. (laughs) 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 That's the ignorance of people who live on the east and west coast (laughs) that don't know anything about the middle. (laughs) So he took the job at Creighton and I came over here and got one the same week we were here for the interview. I got one at UNO. Paul Hader was chairman. Yes. And the department was much smaller than it is Very now. Very small, wasn't it? Comparatively. I think there were nine. Um, there were nine people who were at some level of professorship, and uh, a few instructors. What was your impression when you first came to the city? And not only the city, as you mentioned, but of the campus. It was different then, wasn't it? Yes, but I thought it looked very nice. It it uh, had, um, and I had not, except for as a graduate assistant, this was my first full-time teaching job in a university. Mm -hmm. So um, I uh, didn't, you know, I was just happy to get the job and I didn't really think about what type of school it was. But uh, it, uh, I liked it very much. I was here at a good time. It was 1968 when we just became the university. Jeff, you were and here then, when they were moving into the system. Right, and there there was a lot of excitement, you know, about uh, starting new and mm-hmm. having a being part of the university mm-hmm. system and so forth. And what did, did you feel that was sort of a tenuous time, a kind of tough time? Uh, no, I thought it was kind of the other way. I felt it was an exciting time, like you were in on something from the ground floor. And you were, yeah. yeah. It was a I thought it was. In fact, I have felt that I have been in on the ground floor of a lot of things. And then uh, shifts in emphasis here, for example, when Dr. Garfinkel became vice chancellor Mm -hmm. and they started pushing more for research. And publication. uh, And Mm -hmm. publication. Uh, Actually, in contrast to what happens now, I was here two years and I was promoted to associate professor and got on tenure after two years. I do have Paul Hader to thank for that because he felt they should count all my public school teaching uh-huh. as experience. And uh, that would never happen now. They, no, nobody no. would care. But it was quite an experience as you described yes, it. Yes, I had a lot of experience. <laughs> and uh, he recognized it, which a lot of other people may not have. And he put my name in for And it was, of course, much easier to get on tenure than into get promoted, but even then, two years was a pretty short time. Now, as you mentioned a moment ago, Barbara, uh, the department was small compared to mm-hmm. what it's become. What were the kinds of programs, people who were interested in pursuing math, as you finally did, mm-hmm. what sorts of things could they get from the Department of Mathematics? Well, actually, we were a more of a math department now. Now we are more of a computer science department. Uh-huh. <laughs> in some ways, it is not as good for the people in mathematics now as it was then. I mean, the majors were math majors. Uh-huh. And the students who were working on master we did have a master's degree program. And when I taught a course, uh, just in contrast, for complex variables where you got both undergraduate and graduate credit, Mm -hmm. you would have like 25 people in it and 15 of them might be undergraduates and 10 of them graduate students. Mm -hmm. That same course I taught last fall had 12 people in it. Only two of them graduate students. Because there are different people now in graduate school are interested in applied mathematics Mm -hmm. Not, uh, though that is somewhat applied at that track. Uh, they're interested in things like stochastic modeling and uh, linear programming, things that are use the computer for mathematics, that kind of thing. Really, math is mainly centered around the computer now, then, as you're saying it. Well, it isn't everywhere. No. But our program now is very much uh, a person who is interested in abstract, pure math uh, our program is not geared to it. We mm-hmm. have the courses, but the main courses now are are in the applied areas. Of course, that's where the jobs are, and uh, where even those who go on to graduate school, when you 
get a PhD. If you just have abstract mathematics, it's more difficult to get a job. And so people who have the combination of the computer science and applied math are, you know, are better prepared for today's mm -hmm. world, I guess. As a professor and having taught in both realms, you might say, uh, do you miss the way it used to be, Barbara? Uh, yes. I think for the mathematician, it's not as good now. For those of us who are interested in mathematics itself, there is a de-emphasis, just as there is everywhere in basic sciences, you know, grants go to people who, you know, they have difficulty getting grants for things that are abstract and in basic. Mm -hmm. um, the students, I know for a fact that we could get more out of the students then. They weren't any smarter, but they, we could be more demanding. I was going to ask you the if same the course, student body had just, changed. Yes. Uh, the students are just as smart, but they are either because they are working too many hours, although our students used to work before, whatever it is, it is the same courses. You could give the same material and the same uh, tests, and it's too demanding. Uh -huh. I'm sorry to say that. Is that right? But that they might complain come. that it's too difficult, you're mm -hmm. expecting too much from them, and it's not any... When I first came here, I taught complex variables like seven or eight times in the first years. And uh, then I didn't teach it for a long time. And when I taught it again, I was like, the students think that you were being so demanding and you're doing the same things that you did before. So I think there is a difference in attitude with what uh, the students are willing, how much time they are willing mm -hmm. to put in the course. It has nothing to do with how smart they are, or how well prepared, and so forth. You think and I see it in calculus classes, too. Mm, is that right? Well, uh, the makeup, the size in all of our university has grown and changed, yeah. and of course the complexion of your department has changed a lot uh, but with the computer coming on. This was inevitable almost, though, wasn't it, what's happening? Yes. I think it was good for our department because our department has been growing all the time, even when others have been having trouble growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, would not have had uh, many of the things that we did if we didn't have the computer science there too, because that's where the legislature is willing to put the money uh -huh. and so forth. And I think this fall, for the first time, we will have more computer scientists in the department than mathematicians. Is that right? And even before, a lot of our computer scientists were really retooled mathematicians. Previously, who they had been mathematicians uh -huh. and went back and became computer scientists. Now we're getting a different breed. These are computer scientists who've been nothing but computer scientists, majored in it in undergraduate, graduate work, and so forth. Now, you really mentioned something interesting a while ago, that really the students felt that some of the things you were offering and had offered in previous years were kind of too, too demanding. Is that caused by this electronic age of the computer and so on? Do they expect things to happen too easily and too fast? What? I don't know what it's ca caused by. I, I think that, and I have taught at every level, so I would not say, I would not do as others, I would not say that the high schools aren't preparing them. That's not true. The high schools around here do a very good job and have excellent teachers and so forth. It, but there is something wrong when large numbers of students who took these courses in high school come and can't pass a placement test to mm -hmm. get into algebra, for example. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, personally, I think that uh, maybe it's the way we're... There has to be something wrong with how we're teaching math in grade school, junior high, and high school because it, the results show that large numbers of students, now we're not talking about top students, of course, but large numbers of average to, to weak math students come to the university, have trouble even passing a placement test to get into the intermediate algebra. Mm -hmm. And even those who've had the required amount of math in high school, it, uh, I think possibly it's because we spoon feed it to them and that's one of the reasons I like the math lab that we have, where the students have to work independently. They complain all the time about it. But the truth of the matter is that I have done many studies and published studies on, on the effectiveness of the 
independent uh, laboratory approach to the elementary courses. Mm -hmm. And they are, it is much more effective. The student who goes through that course, but you do have to learn how to study independently and is work independently, and that's what they're not very good at. Is that sort of thing evident at other universities too, or are we oh, kind of yeah. unique? No, all the schools that have these, uh, no, it is very evident everywhere. All of these schools that have these independent, uh, all the schools are having trouble, trouble with handling what to do with a freshman level math course for the same. Not something so unique to us here. No, except of course the stu uh, some schools have a more selective admission, but I mean yeah. all schools comparable to us. Yeah, yeah. At, uh, for example, at the University of Arizona, they have all the students now take those courses I at a computer. And it's like when you take your uh, driver's license, you know how you're doing as you go along. Mm -hmm. And uh, after they, I don't know exactly, but let's say they, they have to get so many right without four in a row wrong or something like that. Without, they have to get so many in a row right. I have a niece that was telling me that it really makes you nerve wracked yeah. to sit there punching in your answers and you know you've missed three and if you miss four then the <laughs> thing is going to shut off. <laughs> and if it shuts off you can't come back till the next day to take it over. It's undue pressure. It reminds <laughs> me of the driving test. Right. Yeah. So we are more personal than that. Mm -hmm. uh, I started the math lab in 1975 with a grant from the National Science Foundation. And uh, it was not unique with me. I copied it after those that had been done at University of, of San Diego and at Cal California State College at San Diego, at uh, University of Arizona, mm -hmm. at Arizona State, all of these places. And I visited a lot of schools. And I just incorporated the things I liked from each one. We only had, um, I think, 400 students that year in it all together, and that was intermediate algebra, college al pre-calculus algebra, and trigonometry. Mm -hmm. But uh, then we hired a math lab director. We hired a math lab director what is who oh. we had several over the years, and I only did it the one year when it was experimental. And in 1980, we were looking for a math lab director and I began to, I was getting concerned that it was getting off its original track of what it was intended uh -huh. to be. Uh, people had made changes in it that really made it not much different than the regular classes. So I offered to take it over again as a lab director. And we were still in the Quonset huts over near the Arts and Sciences Very good building. Very old Quonset huts. I mean, it was terrible. We had two Quonset huts, and we had four, about 450 <laughs> students each semester going through this program. Well, we were only there one year, and we moved into the Durham Science Building. We have a magnificent setup. Yes. There. I think one of the best in the country, to Isn't tell you the wonderful? truth. Uh, the math lab uh, arrangement and a whole suite of rooms and. It's just perfect. We also kept enlarging how many students we would take in. Now I ran it for four years and I, when I, until this last year, and when I left we had about a thousand students each semester. A thousand? We now have 1,500 yes, yeah. each semester. Uh, of course I had to groom my own replacement. We had <laughs> uh, Dr. Reck, Janice Reck, who was a, um, an instructor in our department, uh, and she had her own motivation, but I helped to push her to, to get her doctorate down at Lincoln, mm -hmm. and she did, and then I conveniently retired from the math lab job <laughs> just when she got her degree, well, that hoping she well. would get the job, and she did, and so she, this last year, it was her first year, and she had, because we extended it to evening classes too, we now have all of our classes uh, taught through the math lab that are taking uh, the first algebra course and the pre-calculus algebra course. So it includes just about everybody. That's right. Well, uh, it sounds like you're very enthusiastic about the program the way it is right yes. now, Barbara. Am I yes. correct? I'm really pleased with our freshman program, mm -hmm. and we have some very good instructors who are on, who only have master's degrees, so they're not on tenure track, but they can stay as long as six years. Mm -hmm. 
we have some very good ones teaching the beginning calculus. And I think that our freshman and sophomore program is very, while I was directing the math lab, I was also coordinator of um, the lower level courses, so I hired the part-time teachers. And we had a lot of part-time teachers, which is not good for a department, even though we had good part-time teachers. Which is common on our campus, of yeah. course, or has been. But we have now, in the math end, pretty much eliminated the need for part-time teachers. And on the computer science end, I think very shortly we won't need uh, very any, you know, very many, because we are, we've had so many new people coming in in computer science. One thing that's pointed up the growth is a, in the the math program, as you described, that you worked with the lab to a thousand and more and fifteen hundred. Uh, what are we into now? Is something that's going to be? Is the, are these all people who are very interested in computer-related work? No, these are people whose departments required them to take math, <laughs> 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 and, and they don't want. To. <laughs> no, it's unmotivated people, most oh. of them. <laughs> the uh, because the more and more departments in the university have strengthen the requirements mm -hmm. in mathematics. Mm -hmm. uh, the College of Business used to only require the one algebra course, then they started requiring pre-calculus algebra. That do, you, do you go along and uh, like this sort of thing, what they're doing? Yes, however, I do think that, uh, as in lots of other things around here, programs like that decide they're going to require math, but we don't get the money to so increase the resources mm -hmm. to handle it. Mm -hmm. And I spent most of my time, we didn't even have a real budget in the math lab when I took it over in 1980. I think the biggest things I managed to do was to get us a budget line, get our own money in there. And actually, it was a very hard job for four years, I have to admit. The, when I left, when I ran it, when I started, we had no secretarial help except student help. Mm -hmm. And then we had student tutors and four graduate assistants. When I left, when Janice took it over, she has an assistant director, a full-time secretary, <laughs> and uh, I had a half-time secretary eventually. But I mean, I got all these things. And so when she took it over, it was like I felt like three people took over for what I did. It reminds me of the old days we were telling about the new teachers getting 3,600. Yeah, that's right. And you're getting 28. Yeah. It's, uh, things really change. But I, so I'm glad that I, that I feel it was a good achievement. Mm -hmm. There were some other things that I, along the way, before the math lab or during that time, one time I was an assistant dean in Dean Newton's office when he had rotating assistant yeah, deanship. Yeah, uh -huh. I wanted, and during that year, Dr. Garfinkel needed help in his office with the Distinguished Scholarship Program. So one of the things that I am proud of is I wrote the first guidelines for the Distinguished Scholarship Program and when it, the first year it was being organized. And in the Dean's office, I think the main thing was the Honors Program. Orv Menard had, Orv Menard had written a guidelines for an Honors Program the previous mm -hmm. year when he was Assistant Dean, but it hadn't been implemented yet. I implemented it and then I wrote um, guidelines and went around and convinced various colleges for all university honors programs. So uh, I feel that was a big yeah. achievement at the time. And then the following year, we hired, uh, then Rosemary Saltzman yes. became, uh, was hired part-time at that time. I don't know what it is now. And she actually implemented it. I think I, she uh, developed uh, she, most, most of her load was involved with it. Right. Uh, she actually implemented it, but I had started, had gotten the ball rolling, had gotten it started, and I like to think I was instrumental in uh, getting it started. Uh, you have spent lots of years here now at the university, and many students have gone through your doors, but also you've had a lot of colleagues, not only in the math department, but in other parts of our liberal arts college and the university generally. And what I like to do with people on reflections here is have you reflect for a moment on some of the people which make the university up really that stand out in memory as having been helpful to you as well as to the university generally. People that really are sort of 
beacon lights in your life? Well, I've mentioned one already, Paul Hader, who was the chairman of the math department when I came. And um, another person that I had a lot of, did a lot of professional work with was Paul Ackerson from the College of Education. He and I together had, I think it was four or five, I mean, we had grants from the National Science Foundation for in-service for math teachers. Mm -hmm. And he, it was just ideal working with him. He didn't want to have anything to do with administrating. He just wanted to carry out the program. I did the administration. It was a perfect, we were a perfect team nice together. Nice team. He really is a great person. Wonderful man. And um, then when I was working in the dean's office, I had two grants from the local CETA group that I developed for a disadvantaged youth in the summer. I think oh. the program is still around, oh, but good. I gave it away to the counseling department. Uh -huh. But one of the people that I worked with a lot then was Jim Martinez, who was a counselor oh, yeah. in the um, he was a counselor in the uh, counseling office here, and now is with the Omaha, Omaha uh, with Public the Schools. Omaha Public Schools. And uh, we ran two summer programs that I think were very innovative and very. Uh, it, they were based on instead of in the summer work program instead of these students working at jobs that led to nothing those who were had just graduated from high school and were college capable perhaps were not intending to go to college we had them coming to school instead they got paid under the summer works program their work was going to school uh -huh. and we had special courses for some of them but some of them we had regular courses uh, in which they got college credit. And I believe there is a program similar to that still going on. Mm -hmm. That sounds like parts of the Goodrich program. Uh, yes, yeah, so and there's this. Almost. It, it, true, that's mm -hmm. true. To help disadvantaged so youth. Right. And um, other people, well, I. Uh, when Roskins was Chancellor, I felt that he was a big influence. And of course, I think that Chancellor Weber has been. I think he's been really good. And I think that uh, I worked, after all, in his office, besides his being my dean, that Dean Newton has mm -hmm. been a big influence in my life. He was extremely supportive of anything I wanted to do uh, when I was trying to get the math lab organized and when I was trying to get it funded or whatever I wanted to do, as long as I could tell him where the money should come from, he was willing to do it. I can echo your comment there. He's very helpful <laughs> in the series you and I are a part of right now as we record yeah. it. He's very supportive. I have felt that he was, uh, any idea I ever brought to him or when there was criticism and we had lots of criticism of the type of instruction in the math department from counselors and from other college people. He always stuck by me, and uh, he would call and ask me about, and I'd give him my rationale about why I thought they were wrong, and he supported me highly. Well, people are really what make up a place, isn't it? Mm -hmm. the, the folks you work with and those that are, in a teaching sense, your students. You've taught for a, a long time, and I think some of the things you've told us here on this tape have been that you've enjoyed the special programs, projects that you worked with, so much, but in all of it, your basic thing as a part of our university has been to teach. Uh, has your life as a teacher changed much in the way you've taught, the way you think you should teach over these many years, Barbara? Yes, I um, don't think that in courses like calculus and advanced courses that it has changed much and probably should, it probably should change. They're still very much taught, you know, the lecture type with not much innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that the kind of teaching we did with independent study in the math lab is different. Every teacher likes to feel that, that they are essential to the program. Mm -hmm. you, you do not feel essential in an independent study program. The students, in fact, the students, you ask them, who was your math teacher in algebra? And they'll say, I didn't have one. I took it in the lab. <laughs> and that just aggravates me because they had 
many teachers. What sure. they didn't have was a teacher a standing teacher. up there lecturing in front of the room. And that's what they were used but, to. But, you know, you'd like to think that your lectures make a significant difference. But, in fact, uh, I published, I forgot to mention another person, I published two papers with Dick Wyckoff from the psychology oh, yeah. department. Uh -huh. And I've published papers with Larry Stevens in our department. Mm -hmm. They're both in statistics. I want a psychologist, but they are both they were involved in the statistical end of the studies. And uh, the, there is no question, because there have been many other people who have published papers too on it, that having lectures does not add to the effectiveness to these algebra <laughs> programs. That's just the way it is anymore. <laughs> it just huh? we like, makes the teacher feel better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I would say that uh, when I taught in high school, you're more personally involved. The problem with the university is when I taught in high school by the end of the first week I knew everybody's name even though I had 200 students maybe. You made an effort to know everybody's name. In a university class sometimes you don't know their name by the time the semester's over which mm -hmm. is sort of mm -hmm. troublesome. I might, I would recognize the name, I would recognize their face when I see them in fact, I run into students all the time in the grocery store. My own children say, you must know everybody, Mother. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, no. If they smile and say hello, it must be somebody I knew from yes. you. <laughs> I know what you're saying. But uh, you recognize their face. You recognize their name on a list, but sometimes you don't attach the name to the person. There have been some students I have become very close to, particularly ones that worked for me in the math lab. Mm -hmm. I have felt that... Uh, they, I had a very special relationship with them, both the undergraduate and graduate students who worked for under me. The Maybe program. you're answering part of this question, but I still want to pose it, and that is, over these years, Barbara, of research, writing, teaching, what's been the most satisfying aspects of all of this? The thing that you like to look back on with the most pleasure? Okay, there are two things I really enjoy doing. I really do enjoy standing up there explaining something in math and and seeing that they caught on, mm -hmm. that people got. I mean, and I enjoy helping somebody on a one-to-one -one basis that you can easily see then. I really do still enjoy teaching mathematics. Uh, the other thing is I really enjoy curriculum projects, uh, thinking of various improvements in curriculum, uh, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sometimes get really caught up in them and I don't always, uh, I'm interested in the studies for my own sake and not really that interested in <laughs> writing them up to have them published. <laughs> you just enjoy the doing. <laughs> right, I want to find out and mm -hmm. I want to find out if they were successful and once I find out, it's not that important or interesting to me to write up an article to be published just so you can list that you had so many yeah. publications. And so and sometimes I have not bothered to do so when I should have, I suppose. The, and it's not that I don't like to write. I was an English minor. I like to write. It's just that I'm ready to go on to a new project then. I'm, by that time, I'm through with that mm -hmm. one and I'm not mm -hmm. interested in spending all that time writing a paper about it. You know, one thing you mentioned a while ago as we sit here and visit was that students now in some of the courses that you used to teach before the computer feel that you're sort of loading it on them and there's yeah. more work than is necessary. And uh, along that line, Barbara, I would ask you, and I think you mentioned it here more recently, you were so excited about the project you were involved with. How do you instill or help start the germ of I want to learn and get off on my own uh, how does that work in the math field? Uh, how are some of the techniques well, that you would use? Well, I think it is difficult because, by the way, I want to correct one thing. I don't think it's the computers that have caused the students to be different. Ah. I just think it's personal pressures in society, the amount of hours they work, uh, mm -hmm. their personal lives, and, you know, they don't take off four years and just be students. No. That no. kind of thing. No. I don't think the computers really had anything to do with it. The, um, the difficulty about instilling this in college is that an awful lot of math you have to take, and I would say all the way through differential equations, 
can the the way that we teach it by nature of the numbers of people in the class and so forth it is difficult to spark that creative or interest in those people that you want to go on because you're emphasizing the basic things that may not seem too creative to them they uh, they have to learn the basic skills mm-hmm. it's just like uh, psychology 101 or biology 101 or whatever it's just crammed full of a lot of things that you have to master before you can get on to the interesting courses Mm -hmm. and some people never get on further to the interesting courses because they think that's what mathematics is all about they're turned off by that first level that's turned off by it and somehow we have to do something so that they won't be turned off by it it takes too long to get into the heart of it to get into the things that would turn them on do you think there's a way that that can be remedied? Well, see, it's getting worse because there's uh, more and more and more information being crammed into beginning courses. And, you know, I see it not just in math, and I have two children who went here to UNO. I, wherever they went, it would be the same. Uh, I uh, think that in these big freshman survey-type courses, I think we turn students off. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're not interesting. They are just a chore. I mean, you have to get through all, master all these facts and so forth. Seems like a lot of busy and work. And it is very difficult. And yet, you have to know it. They cannot give you more advanced stuff. You cannot take more advanced math till you had the basic facts. It would be nice if everybody came into college ready to, ready, say, to start calculus so they would spend... Uh, a little bit of time on this basic stuff and could get into it. I think it is hard to, and by the time you get to that stage where you could stimulate them, other disciplines have siphoned them mm-hmm. off. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that uh, it's just, I don't know the answer. I've taught all these years, and, and I, in fact, see the problem getting worse, not better. Well, Classes are too big, yeah. for example. But now in 1991, Barbara's going to pick up stakes. In fact, not too many days from when we record this program in the late spring of 1991 and move off to her previous home, Tucson. Um, when you get to Tucson now, life's going to change for you too, and not just because of the climate, but you're back in your old haunts. And yet, what are, you, are some of the things you'd like to do as you retire that you haven't been able to do or that you want to do a little bit more of? Well... I think I'm a perennial student. I would like to go to the university and attend certain things. And I would not necessarily just math. I'm interested in finding out more about archaeology. I've never had a course in archaeology, but I have been done a lot of reading and have thought it would be interesting to go to a dig and see how they Mm -hmm. uncover all these civilizations. Uh, You see, history turned me off when I was in college. Did it? I didn't like it at all because it was taught. Uh, in those days, a bunch of facts you memorized. And it's, it's amazing because most of the things I enjoy reading are historical novels. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, I do read a lot. And I, I, could, I would like to take some literature courses. And uh, at the University of Arizona, because of its climate, they sometimes get some very famous people who come there for the winter. And occasionally some really outstanding mathematicians come, you know, and give seminars. And recently I have gotten very interested in the field of chaos. I, just on my own, I've been reading oh. some books about it. And it's a whole different approach to mathematics. It's a whole different thing out of my sphere of knowledge. And it's, uh, I hope I can keep on doing something to use my mind. I don't want to just sit around and play cards all day, no, you know, no. <laughs> retire. No. And I might and I might get back into teaching on a part time basis, even if it's on a volunteer. Here in town I a long time ago I did some volunteer work through CETA through GOCA mm-hmm. it was. Uh, tutoring some uh, students, uh, they were element high, upper elementary students in math. And it was very satisfying. The only reason I didn't keep on doing it is because I I, I was a widow and I had two small children and uh, my husband died two years after we came here. I mm-hmm. had a two-month-old and a nine-and-a-half-year-old. Oh so I just didn't have the time to do it. So I might do some volunteer t- 
tutoring. They always need math tutors. Yeah. That's one thing you know for sure. <laughs> they always are willing. They're always anxious to have somebody who will volunteer to help with math. It sounds like Barbara, for someone who in the early stages of life had no intention of teaching, <laughs> you've turned a full circle here, and now are continuing on not only to teach but you want to be a continuing student too. Yeah. Well, I always was a student. I mean, when you realize I got my degree in 1952, and then I got my master's in 60 and my Ph.D. in 68, you can see I went to school all my life. A lot of years there. <laughs> but uh, I come from a family like that. I told you I had seven of us. Mm -hmm. uh, we probably have more degrees among the seven of us than <laughs> anybody I know. Was it sort of catchy in the family, one thing led uh, to another among all of you? Well, fortunately, we were all very good students. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, uh, you had a lot of encouragement, perhaps, too, uh, I from think your my, parents? I really think my parents had a great deal to do with it, in the sense they were always very interested in what we did in school and made a big thing out of each achievement mm -hmm. that we had. And uh, I have a sister with a Ph.D. and who is a curriculum consultant in Los Angeles Public Schools, and uh, another sister is a reading specialist in Tucson Public Schools. Uh -huh. Another one who's the vice president of a bank, I guess she opted to make money. <laughs> <laughs> and my brother is a uh, uh, a computer analyst, uh -huh. his consultant, he has his own company. Well, it sounds like you're going to have a nice, full, and exciting life in Tucson with friends and relatives reacquainted. I'm looking and forward no runs. to it. Yeah. I will miss you, I know, though. What are some of the things you'll miss about? Our well, place. my wor co-workers, I, I, we have a very nice department, and I have, I can honestly say, you know, I was the only tenured, I was the only woman on the tenure track until last year. Is that right? In all these years. And now uh, Janice Reck and a new person we have, Dr. Betty Hickman, who is a computer scientist. And I think that I am being replaced by a woman whose field, I think, is number theory, who is coming in the fall. So we will suddenly have three that are on the tenure track. But all these years, oh, it's Margaret Gessman, who is now a graduate dean, mm -hmm. of course she was in our department, oh, yeah. and then she was chairman of our department. So I won't say I was the only one all these years. I forgot. But uh, then Margaret left and is in the graduate mm -hmm. office. I have been the only woman, but I have never felt discriminated against in the, in the department. Uh, one thing I think that happens in math and science, I think you are more just judged for what you do than in some other disciplines. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't that we wouldn't hire women. It's hard to, when you find a woman who is qualified, who's looking for a math teaching job, everyone else is looking for that person too. They are in they demand. Manage, they manage to get them away from us. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I will miss my coworkers. And uh, I think, uh, and many friends in other departments because I was active in the faculty senate oh, yeah. and the AAUP and uh -huh. other activities. So that uh, I think hard times are coming right now for the university. In some ways, I'm glad I'm not going to be here to see it. But they'll bound back. We've once. had hard times before in the past. Yes, <laughs> and we've lived through it. That we had to live through. Well, I tell you, this has been very nice for me to have the opportunity to sit for about an hour and and visit with you about your past and your present and a couple of things or so about your future. And speaking for my colleagues and friends here on the campus and yours, we wish you the best of everything, Barbara, as you thank move you. on to a, a new life in an old home. Yes, thank you. It's nothing nicer than sitting for a whole hour and talking about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we had the chance to take part. Thank you for the opportunity. This has been another in the series which I started about 12 years ago called Reflections in Time. My guest in this recording in the late spring of 1991 has been Barbara Buckholder. I always have trouble with that last name, but I'm going to get it right yet, Barbara, who's been visiting with me about her life here and her early life and life as it's going to be in the months to come in retirement. Yes, another reflection in time.